I'd like to begin by uh, telling you a true story, um, a story that demonstrates and epitomizes the massive amount of work we have to do as Muslims living in America, or American Muslims, Muslim Americans, however you want to call yourself. Um, a uh, story that uh, demonstrates oftentimes there is an inverse relationship between information and knowledge. Because you would think if there's a lot of information, or someone has a lot of information, they'd be very knowledgeable. So you can go on the internet today and you can find a lot of information about Islam that will keep you busy until you're 90 years old, right? But yet, the ignorance of the ignoramuses has yet ceased to amaze me. People are still getting stupider. Why are people getting stupider when there's so much information? Why is this inverse relationship present? It's because, as Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi ta'ala said, that the secret of this ummah, the secret of this Islamic nation, is the sanad, is the transmission. Transmission from a qualified source. Information is converted into knowledge only when the source of the information is authoritative. It's common sense. I gave this example last night at the church, and I'll give it again. Do you guys know who Elmo is? Elmo, so it's on Sesame Street. Yes, the kids know. If Elmo told you that drinking Diet Coke, for example, gives you osteoporosis, you may be inclined not to believe Elmo. Right? You say Elmo's a puppet, and his best friend is Cookie Monster, and Cookie Monster's an addict. Right? So I'm not going to believe Elmo. But if someone like Dr. Oz, for example, whose first name is Muhammad, by the way, and uh, Sheikh al Bakri one time was, uh, came to our, we, uh, he was at our masjid, he told us his first, his first name is Mehmed, which is a, a pocket-painted form of Muhammad, right? But you never heard hear about his first name, right? It's always Oprah or you know Geraldo, first names, or Dr. Phil, right? Even Donahue, you know, his first name is Phil, but you never hear the first name of God. It's always Dr. Oz, right? Anyway, if Dr. Oz told you that drinking Diet Coke would lead to osteoporosis, you might say, you know what? He's a doctor, and he knows what he's talking about, right? Because the source is authoritative, right? So the problem, however, is today we have a bunch of Elmos wearing Dr. Oz costumes and talking about our religion, like they know what they're talking about. You have like Daniel Elmo Pops, or Steve Gonzo Emerson, or Ayan Hirsi, whatever, George Jetson, something or other. This is a major problem. So this story I want to tell you, getting to the story now, is I was at a church one time. I do a lot of, like we heard, I do a lot of interfaith work. And I was at a church, uh, and there was a pastor who apparently was a former Muslim, and he was giving a sermon called, Why I Am Not a Muslim. This was the name of his sermon. And it's interesting, um, do you guys know who Ergun Kainer is? You just need to stay, at, stay on top of current events. Ergun Kainer was a man who was the dean of Liberty University. Liberty University is the most so-called prestigious university, evangelical Christian university in America. He was the dean. He was recently fired, terminated from his position because they had found out, Liberty had found out, that he had lied on his application and that he was never a Muslim at all. So I guess the moral of the story for Ergun Kainer is you never con a con man. Um, nonetheless, uh, so I went to this church sermon called Why I'm Not a Muslim. And the first thing they did was they showed this, uh, this uh, video. <laughs> and the first shot was a black and white shot of the Twin Towers on fire. There's this really dramatic music and then there's this voiceover, right, that said, they're amongst us. Right. You know like the movie guy, the movie voiceover guy? It was like similar to that. And I was thinking, who's amongst us? Oh, right. <laughs> and then they showed, they suddenly cut to this uh, woman in a hijab buying groceries at a supermarket. Right? And it said, they live in our neighborhoods. <laughs> and then they cut to another shot of a little girl with a hijab walking across the street past the crossing guard with a little backpack, you know. They go to our schools. And then it said, they, live, they work in our cities. And it showed a man, a Sikh, driving a cab with a turban on. And I was thinking to myself, you know, the, the turban's obviously sunnah of our messengers, Allah, uh, but if people don't know 
uh, the difference between a Sikh and a Muslim, they probably should not be making uh, informational videos about Islam. But I looked around the crowd to see if, you know, they thought it was as funny as I thought it was funny. Uh, but people were absolutely riveted by this video. They just thought, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Right? And then, of course, you know, they kind of look at me, you know, because I, I was sitting in the back. You know, but that's show business. There's no business like it. No business, I know. Um, so these are truly interesting times that we're living in. You know, the Chinese, they have this blessing, and some say it's a curse. They say, may you live in interesting times. We live in times where freedom of expression is used to justify the denigration of the holiest of Islamic sanctities, like International Book Burning Day, whatever, or International Cartoon Drawing Day. But when Muslims want to exercise that very same freedom and build a mosque for the love of God, it's a mosque, it's a house of worship in New York City, it's called inappropriate, unacceptable, offensive, right? That's like telling us, you can sit on the bus, but you have to go to the back. If that mosque is not built, then we are no longer America. This isn't America anymore. If that mosque isn't built, the very founding principles of America are compromised. We live in interesting times where people who actually think and use their brains and point out the massive inconsistencies, contradictions, and inconceivabilities in the so-called official version of events are called crazy conspiracy nuts. Yet, it is these same people who are doing the name-calling, who believe wholeheartedly that a Muslim conspiracy was successfully pulled off to control the White House. One in five Americans believe that the President of the United States is a secret Muslim. He's a Muslim on the DL, right? Which has other connotations which we won't go into. He's, he's practicing taqiyya, right? He's a secret Muslim. Most of these people who believe this are part of a party that likes to drink a lot of chai. <laughs> they catch my drift. They give chai a bad name. Maybe they should be refudiated. Um, that's even a word. These are interesting times where people who don't even know a shred about Islam are teaching Muslims about Islam according to their caprice and defining our own terminology. And as we know, whoever defines the terminology will control the discourse. So what they want to do is they want to conflate the word terrorist with Muslim. The goal is to make them interchangeable, to make them synonymous. Um, but the truth of the matter is that no two words are more diametrically opposed than these two words. Muslim obviously comes from the word salam, which means peace, and peace and terror are, to put it grammatically, absolute antonyms, opposites, terrorists. Is, terrorist is the Muslim, as black as the white, or up is the down. But you have these, you know, jokers going on TV or saying these unbelievable things. And again, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. You know, they have this eat stamp. Remember the eat stamp? It said E E I D in English, and then it said it in Arabic calligraphy. There's this guy on TV saying, if you read it backwards, because Muslims read right to left, it says die. <laughs> It's hilarious, isn't it? So I'm sitting there, wait, is this, is, this a, is this a comedy act or what's going on here? You know, I was in a Starbucks the other day when I was suddenly accosted by someone and uh, they were saying these types of things and Muslims are violent, blah, blah, blah. So I said, you know, a lot of your information actually comes from these sources that make up these things like the eat stamp, right? And I, and I wrote it out for him, and he saw it, he's like, oh my goodness, that's true, it does say die. And wow. And I said, yeah, but if you put Mubarak there, eat Mubarak, it says, boom, die. <laughs> and then he found out that I was joking. So, that's what they want to do. They want to conflate these terms, terrorist and Muslim. I remember when this person, he was an Asian student at VTech, uh, he, he killed like 30 people there. You guys remember this a few years ago? Nobody even talks about it anymore. The VTech, right? Uh, and I was in my cubicle that day, and I, was, I went to CNN.com, and I read the, one of the first reports that came out, and they gave a perfect physical description of him, right? Right down to the color of this and that. And at the very end, it says, it said, there's no indication that he was a terrorist. There was no indication that he was a terrorist. So I thought to myself, um, What's a terrorist then? Because if I'm chilling in my French class, and a guy rolls up and puts his Glock 9mm in my face, I'm going to be terrified. Won't you be terrified? Doesn't that invoke terror? You see, 
The point is that he wasn't Muslim or didn't look didn't look Muslim, didn't look the part, so he's obviously not a terrorist. Right? This type of thing. So they are trying to define our terminology. Now I asked one of my professors, say, why why wasn't he not a terrorist? And he said, Well, he didn't have a religious motive. There was no religious motive. Right? And then, you know, I read his manifesto. I don't know people if you read his manifesto, it's a long manifesto, but at the very end of the manifesto, he said, quote, I die like Jesus Christ. Right? But I guess he's not a terrorist. These are interesting times in which countries like France have demonstrated that they are against Islam mandating a dress code for women. How do they demonstrate that? By mandating a dress code for women. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this 2020 special on ABC. They were talking about, uh, about Islam or something, Islam in America. They interviewed this man from the French parliament and they said to him, aren't you, aren't you doing the very same thing that you're condemning? Right? You're saying it's, it's against the law to wear the hijab in France? Right, in protests for Muslims, we had opinion of women to believe that every woman in France is being forced by some overlord husband or, or brother or someone to wear the hijab. This has, this, this has a bad opinion of women in general, that they can't think for themselves. They have to be told what to do. If it's really about freedom, why don't we just give them the choice and let them wear what they want to wear? It's about freedom and liberty, right? But it's not about freedom. Freedom is a pretense. It's all about control. <coughs> so in conclusion, I'd like to ask I like all of us to ask ourselves, you know, what are we doing to better ourselves and others? What kind of a world are we living, uh, leaving for our children? So tonight is a good start. We have to uh, uh, support these types of causes um, and go back to the basics. We have to go back to basics, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran that if your children, your parents, your spouses, your houses, your wealth, anything is more dear to you if any of these things any of these material ephemeral temporal things are more dear to you than allah and his messenger and striving and struggling in his path then just wait about wait until allah brings about his decision so certain verses in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a a wa'ad he'll make a promise and Allah never breaks His promise. Wa'ad Allah haq. He never breaks His promise. And there are certain verses in the Quran where Allah will make a threat, a wa'id, wa'ad, wa'id, wa wa'id. When Allah makes a threat, we should take it seriously. If someone calls your house and makes a threat to you, if you go to sleep tonight, I'm going to firebomb your house. We'll take it very seriously. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is making a wa'id. We should take it seriously. We have to ask ourselves, where do we stand? Do we love Allah and His Messenger more than anything? Right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, an nabiyu awladil mu'minina min anfusihim. The believers prefer the life of the Prophet over their own lives. So we have to ask ourselves, where do we stand? When a companion named Khubay uh, was taken to this place called Tan'im, and he was crucified, and the Quraysh, the mushrikeen of the Quraysh, were uh, mocking him when he was hanging on the cross. They said to him, don't you wish Muhammad was in your place, and you were at home safe? And he said, I don't wish that a, th a thorn prick the finger of the Messenger of God. And Abu Sufyan ibn Duhaq was there, and at the time he was a Muslim. And he said, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا يُحِبُّ أَحَدًا فَحُبِّ أَسْحَابِ مُحَمَّدٍ مُحَمَّدًا I have never seen anyone love anyone like the companions of Muhammad love Muhammad. This is an attribute of Muslims. They put Allah and His Messenger first. Wallahi, many of the problems that we're going through, the cause of many of these issues, the cause of many of these things that I mentioned earlier about our interesting times, it's all our fault. It's all our fault. We're not presenting the message. We don't get our priorities straight. This is what happens. The Prophet Wasallam said, none of you truly believe until I am more beloved to him than his father, his son, and all of mankind. And all of mankind. So this is what we have to work on, inshallah ta'ala. We have to... Uh, first and foremost, take care of ourselves, take care of our families, in institute the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah is It's extremely important within our own household. How was the Prophet How did he treat his wife? How did he treat his children? How did he treat his neighbor? These things start at the local level. And then we move to the community, and then we move to the country, right? There's a reason why we're in this state that we're in, why there's such heightened Islamophobia. There's many examples like this. But first and foremost, we should start with ourselves, take care of our families and our communities. And inshallah ta'ala, when we implement the sunnah, the sunnah is a shining light. People are attracted to it. It never goes in and out of, uh, 
It's, it's never unfashionable. You know, sometimes, you know, people used to wear their, when I was in elementary school, they used to wear their clothes backwards. You know, that was the fad at the time. Or you have like a, some kind of hairdo or something like that, or some kind of shoe. Or, the sunnah is always in fashion. People recognize it. People, people are drawn to it. Because the Prophet وسلم, is not like a normal human being. He's the best of creation. So implement the sunnah, inshallah ta'ala, and, and, and support these causes. And I'm sorry for going over my time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you.